<laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sunday. I'm an alcoholic. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you all for being here. I know you're risking the elements and exposure. Um, and for everybody that's on Facebook, hi. I'm glad that you're with us. Uh, so I've, ha- I've been blessed to have the opportunity to speak to others before, not in the AA forum. And so it truly is an honor and a privilege to be able to share my experience. And even if it just touches one person, to me that's you know, truly amazing. Um, so it's kind of funny, I'll share this with you. So today I was supposed to be a guest speaker at AMIOP and because of everything that's going on, um, it got rescheduled. And so when Kelly asked me about it, of course, I said, you know, can I pray about it, talk to my sponsor, and I'll get back to you. And then I thought, you know, like, this is God, like, telling me, like, hey, somebody needs to hear your story. And so I'm just really grateful to be here. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm supposed to tell you what things were like, what happened, and what things are like now. So my sobriety date is 7 March of 2019, so just a little over a year ago. I do have an, a sponsor. She's absolutely amazing. Um, she has a sponsor. I have a home group. It's this home group right here. Ooh, ooh, primary purpose. We meet on Mondays and Thursdays. And right now we are also doing Facebook. So, you know, we're fluid with everything that's going on, and that's awesome. Um, So, um, a little southern girl from the middle of nowhere in Virginia, one stoplight town. Um, I pretty much grew up in the same town my entire life. Uh, My parents, they were married twice, divorced twice. Uh, My mom, when I was two, maybe three, uh, my my youngest brother, he's a year younger than me, and um, when he was about one or two, my mom just said, I'm out, can't do this. And so I grew up in a dysfunctional um, home. I had a wicked stepmother. She treated me like Cinderella, like really, I'm literally a redheaded stepchild. Um, so, so um, you know, growing up, uh, I had, I have three brothers, no sisters. And, um, you know, because of what happened with my biological mother, everything was very hush-hush in my house. Like, you don't ask questions about her, you don't. Uh, you know, they're like, sh- mm-hmm. she's just a secret, like, you know, is she watching somewhere? You know, like my dad is super paranoid about it. Um, but my, I have a stepmother, like I said, she's pretty wicked, but she, you know, I have mad respect for her. She made sure that there was food on the table. We never had to worry about whether or not, you know, we were going to have electricity. We had what we needed, not what we wanted all the time for sure. But um, for that, I definitely have always had a respect for her. I mean, she was a 19-year-old woman that married my dad with three young children, you know, and um, especially as I got older, had my own children, and in sobriety especially, I've been able to say, you know what, like, she did the best that she could with what she had. I come from a long line of alcoholics. My dad was a highly functional alcoholic. My grandfather, uh, my brother, who's a year younger than me, he's been sober for almost 16 years. Um, My very first, um, like, you know, growing up I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no clue what it was really about. Um, You know, Grey's Anatomy, Dr. Richard Weber sitting around in the circle. Um, It's definitely not how we do things here. You know, but that was really my concept of Alcoholics Anonymous. And even with my brother being sober, um, I just, I I didn't know what it was all about. And man, you know, I, I don't ever really regret anything because I feel like everything that happened in my life up until this point has gotten me to exactly where I'm at. And Um, you know, the only thing that I do, uh, regret is that I hurt people along the way. Um, as a child, I don't ever remember, I don't recall that not being a part of, I don't recall, um, you know, feeling awkward. I mean, maybe I did, but I just, I I don't have a very vivid memory of that. What I do have a very vivid memory of is feeling very unloved, very unworthy of love, um, and just, you know, I was just there, you know, and, and maybe in the way, and um, my parents weren't involved, like my, you know, my dad, my stepmom, I call her mother, mom, um, they weren't involved with us children, you know, it's like, go do your homework, go outside and play, you know, we were really just there, uh, didn't read to us, didn't 
you know, tuck us in at night, things like that. Um, so I, I never really felt like I was just loved. I didn't feel like I deserved it. You know, my, my biological mom left. So I just, um, doing my fourth step, you know, and seeing the trends in my life and things that, you know, went all the way back to being a child, I could see the fear, the fear of abandonment, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not being loved, the fear of being unworthy of love, um, the fear of being, a, you know, just all these fears. And um, I, I don't remember, um, you know, ever thinking with my first, you know, alcoholic experience or first drinking experience, I don't remember that feeling of like, I have arrived. Um, so being from the South, you know, there's moonshine involved, <laughs> you know, all of these different things. And with my dad being um, an alcoholic, I just remember, you know, when I was a young child, you know, it's like, hey, you know, here, try this. And it wasn't to pour it down our throat. It was like, here, you want to try this? Like, sure. You know, and I remember as a kid thinking like, mm, you know, oh, that burns. You know, I never thought like, ooh, this is for me that, that I can remember. Um, I know that watching my dad and how things were, like he would come into the house with his sunglasses on, and that's how he knew he'd been drinking. So, you know, he'd come in with his sunglasses on, and he'd sit down, and he's drinking out of his, you know, coffee cup or whatever, which I came to do later on in my drinking years. But um, just sitting there watching TV with his sunglasses on, and we're like, mm, yep, yeah, he's, he's been drinking. And, you know, the sad thing is that um, as I got older, I remember looking forward to my dad coming home and having been drinking because that was like the one time that he really showed any kind of like attention or love, you know, to us and, you know, oh, come here, baby girl, you know, I'm so proud of you and, you know, all these different, um, you just like, affect, he was very affectionate when he'd been drinking. And um, so that kind of, you know, like to me that gave the, like I approved him that for him to drink, you know, but then I also saw the side, a, a different side of him. Um, my grandfather was an alcoholic, my uncle was an alcoholic, um, my grandmother, granny, God bless her, she, uh, she, she did not touch it, and, um, you know, she watched my grandfather, and my father, and my dad, and, you know, all of us, really, and she was my, very much my maternal figure as a child. She's the one that I turned to. She was, you know, she took me to my piano lesson. She took me and my brothers to church. So I do have a religious background. And so much as, you know, I grew up believing in God. Um, I, you know, I was very involved in church. And then, um, I, you know, I became a teenager. I started working. And, you know, I would see folks come in. And just, you know, my whole concept of religion really changed. And, um as, as you know, I got older, I remember, you know, like, I was a straight-A student. Um, I graduated eighth in my class. There was more than just a few of us. Um, I was a cheerleader. I was a majorette. I worked a full-time job. I was also, you know, to me, I was always after that next big thing and looking for acceptance and looking for approval. And that's something that I never, ever received from my parents know, hey, I'm proud of you. Hey, you're doing great things. But for me, there was always that, that internal pressure to really, that drove me. And it was also a distraction. It was a distraction from the BS that I was dealing with at home. It was a distraction from my, my, my thoughts of inadequacy, my thoughts of not being good enough, you know. So I kept myself busy because the busier I was, the better I did the less I had to deal with me. I didn't really have to, to deal with me. When I was a senior in high school, I moved into uh, my grandparents. I moved in with them. Um, and, and my grandfather worked second shift. And so he'd come home at, you know, after a shift. And usually he drank before he went to work. And then he'd come home and he'd have a couple of beers. And he'd say, oh, you want to have a beer with me? I'm like, yeah, Papa, you know. So I'd say, don't tell your granny. <laughs> So, you know, I'd sit down and, you know, and, oh, God bless him, I'd have some, you know, natural light with him. And, uh, you know, one or two, but I don't ever remember thinking this isn't enough. Uh, you know, to me, I, I felt very much a part of with my grandfather. But even still, I didn't feel I have arrived, like this is exactly where I belong. So, you know, fast forward, um, I enlisted in the military. And even as a teenager, once I started drinking, I, I didn't drink daily. 
Um, I wasn't an at work drinker. Um, but once I started drinking, when I was drinking, I was drinking. It was, I was going hard in the paint. There, I, you know, I was going to like do it right. Go hard or go home. And I was going hard and then passing out before I could go home. You know, so um, obviously looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. I always drink alcoholically, even though I didn't always drink. Um, and for me, it wasn't, again, it wasn't like, oh, yes, this amazing feeling. For me, it was always to enhance whatever I was doing. Well, you know, like the sunshine, and I'm going to cut the grass, and I'm going to have this, you know, drink. You know, and I used to say everybody needs to believe in something. I know it's 10 o'clock. I believe I'm going to have a Catman coat. You know, whatever it was, you know. So, you know, it could be raining, and I'm like, yes, perfect reason to drink. Um, you know, I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to escape. So it was always to enhance whatever I was doing or escape from whatever I was dealing with. And, you know, I used to say before I came into the program, can I, can I move this? I feel like yeah. oh, thanks. <laughs> I just, ah, sorry. Don't I'm not, I'm not going to dance. I'm just going to, okay. So um, I totally lost my train of thought. So it was either to enhance what I was doing or escape from whatever I was doing. But I used to say, oh, that's what it was. Before I came into the program, um, you know, I used to just, t like, I, I just truly believed I'm, I'm just exceptional. I just have this high tolerance. Like, isn't this cool? You know, I can drink all of this. You know, and people, well, I, as an alcoholic, thought that was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say what you guys thought because, you know, that's your own experience. But for me, um, I just, I, I remember telling people, like, I don't have a problem drinking. Like, I just don't have this filter. Like, I don't have a filter. Like, I don't have this, like, shut-off valve that says, like, hey, you're good. Because I can, I can never remember just having a couple of drinks and being like, all right, I'm good. I, there was always the need for more, 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 more. And, you know, like, just <coughs> zero to a hundred. And, and that was every time almost. And um, I remember... Um, you know, when I first came into the program and hearing people talk about blackouts, I'm like, man, I'm so glad that never happened to me. Whoa, that is so not true. I mean, I remember, like, waking up on some church parking lot in the morning, like, didn't know how I got, you know. So, like, things had happened to me, but I was just completely delusional, completely insane to the fact that I had a grip on my life. My life was completely unmanageable. Um, when I came into the program, uh, so I, I got here via a jump start with a DWI. The MPs got me on Plank Road. Not recommended. I'm just going to say that. Don't drink and drive, and definitely don't do it on floor break. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so up until that point, like I said, you know, I, I always believed that I had a grip on, like, my drinking. And I didn't even think that, all right, like the, the acknowledgement that, all right, I have something major going on at work tomorrow and I need to get up at zero four, so I'm just not going to drink. But that didn't click. Like, that's not normal. You know, I thought that was completely normal. And then it got to the point where I just said, you know, to hell with it. And I would drink anyway and then suffer the consequences the next day. So the DWI, I'm laying there at the in the jail cell at um, the... Provost Marshal's office there on Fort Bragg. They took my flip-flops. Like, come on, what am I going to do with my flip-flops? Um, so, you know, I'm making like a paper toilet seat cover. They're probably laughing at me. Like, look at this drunk lady. I'm laying there in the cell, and I knew I had a problem when I was laying there, and all I could think about was like, get me out of here so I can go get drunk. So I can go drink this all away. And like that, like... <laughs> Oh, that pit in like, my stomach and that feeling of like, man, the shame, you know, um, all of that, you know, now that there's absolutely no hiding, especially in my profession. Like my command team knew, I, I mean, from the top down, everybody knew like as soon as everything went down. Um, so I, I ended up going to military treatment facility for, um, you know, residential substance abuse treatment. And I'll tell you what, I, they weren't going to send me. And I asked to go, and they're like, well, why do you want to go? Like, to me, like, that, I, I knew everybody talks about their spiritual awakening, you know, uh, or, you know, their spiritual experience. And for me, that DWI was a spiritual shakeup. Like, the good Lord was like, hey, listen here, good, listen here. 
you know, I'm like time to get right. So, um, I, I went to treatment and I just remember just laying there in my bed, like the first night and I said, God, you know, like, please help me. Like, please, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I, I know that I've been a heathen and just running amok, you know, help me. And so I have been so blessed because not once have I struggled with the obsession. Um, I, you know, I just like, I knew, so getting into treatment, that was my very first real exposure to AA. Um, I came in, uh, it was March, March 12th of two, last year. And so they took us around to different meetings at night to expose us to different types of meetings and stuff. And at my very first meeting, it was on a Thursday night, it was a speaker meeting, and the girl's name was Colby. And I remember her sharing her story, and I felt like she really had just like cut open my brain, crawled inside, and was like checking off things off my list of my, my I'm like, hang on, is, is her ESP on or what? You know, so almost to the T, everything, like it fit the bill for me. And I just remember I was in tears. I couldn't breathe. I was ugly crying. It was pretty bad, <laughs> you know. And so um, I just remember thinking, like, what a powerful introduction to AA. And I feel like that really is, set the tone for me and, like, the way ahead for my sobriety. Um, like, I, you know, I've had a fire in my heart, you know, ever since for this program. I truly do believe that it saved my life. Just like I truly believe that, um, you know, my higher power, I call him God, I truly believe that that DWI was my calling to, to wake up, to get right. And, um, you know, I, I feel like he saved me. Like he saved me and he saved someone else, whether it was that night or further on down the road. Because like I said, I'd put my drink in a coffee cup and roll on down the road. And it wasn't because I didn't have any thought or consideration for others or, or was like, oh, I'm just going to go out and drive and, you know, I, I just didn't think about it at all. I just had no, no thought about anybody else and did never once thought like, well, what if I get caught? I just didn't think about it. And it was just a regular thing. And, you know, I firmly believe with every cell in my body that if I had not gotten that DWI that night or got arrested for that DWI, that it wouldn't have been shortly after that I probably would have killed someone, you know, someone's mom, someone, you know, a dad, a family, or myself even. And, you know, and like, what a crappy way for my children to say like, oh, like, mom couldn't even keep it together enough to, to stay alive and not like drink and drive, not break the law and drink and drive, you know. Um, over the years, uh, I used so many things, you know, I had, I won't say I had the crappiest of marriages, but there was a lot of, um, inadequacy. Uh, I was married almost 13 years. I have two beautiful children because of it. He's a really awesome baby daddy. I'm really grateful for him. Um, but, you know, we just weren't right for each other and all the love in the world wasn't going to make that right and all the alcohol in the world wasn't going to make that any different. And, um, you know, like my relationships, you know, like my pendulum, my emotional, emotional pendulum just swung so far left and right. Uh, especially because, like I said, I used alcohol to escape from everything that I was dealing with. And there was no way. I was just completely incapable of maintaining or nurturing or building any kind of healthy relationship. And I can see that now as a result of doing the steps of this program. Um, you know, so married almost 13 years. And then after, you know, the divorce and going through that, like everything involved alcohol. You know, I just... I didn't see it, but I was just snowballing down the hill and, um, you know, entered into some really impulsive relationships after that. And again, like not in a place to maintain or nurture any kind of relationship, like familial, you know, intimate friendship. You know, I was just, no matter how much I wanted to be a good person, like I just could not get it together. Um, thank goodness that, you know, I had my children. So because um, we're we're both dual military. The reason why I don't have my children now, it's not as a result of my drinking. It's as a result of just situations and, you know, units, assignments, things like that. And um, after the divorce, I had my children. And they kept me grounded. You know, I had them. So I had to, I had 
to step up to the plate. My granny, uh, she actually lived with my ex and I for almost eight years and helped take care of my babies while, you know, we went and did the work of our nation. And, um, and not only that, but while we also took advantage of her, you know, here we, here we were, you know, mom and dad, and we've got these two beautiful babies and we've got this live in granny. How easy. It All right, <laughs> granny, we're out, you know, and I, and I look back over that now. And then, you know, um, when, when she passed, it really, like I said, it really forced me to have to step up to the plate to be a mom, the, the very best mom that I could be. And, you know, I, still an alcoholic, but trying my best to control it and not seeing it, you know, it, when I was in the middle of it. Um, you know, and then, like I said, with the assignments and everything, uh, I sent my children to live with my ex-husband in January of 2016. And that was when I really, uh, that's when all hell broke loose. I just really started to spiral out of control. Um, I was drinking all the time. Uh, you know, just put myself in some very risky situations where, you know, I look back over things now and I'm just like, you know, I think I shared it the other night. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how I said it, but, you know, like I truly believe that my higher power was carrying me because there's no way I made it to where I'm at without that you know that you know be, there's some pr I, I don't I'm not going to give you a drunk log I'm not going to talk about all of these crazy things because there's a lot of it you know and I just know that you know like God was there he was holding my hand he was right there the whole time and, you know while I was out there drinking I never really thought about like I knew I was a heathen I knew that I believed in him but I just thought like oh he'll be there when I'm ready to go back to him and he, that's not that's not how he had it planned out obviously and you know this past year has been so beautiful uh it's been just truly amazing and I, you know I used to everything in the world was an excuse or an escape you know justification whether it was not having my children whether it was I had a crappy day at work whether it was I missed my granny, you know, because she was no longer with us. All of these different things are, you know, or my ex-husband did this to me, or this person did that to me, or my stepmom this, and, you know, all these things. Um, they were just excuses, you know. People call them demons. I call them excuses, uh, you know, and um, <laughs> that's, that's really, like, for me, that's the best way I can explain it, um, you know, and... I, you know, I thought I had so much heartache in my life and thought, you know, like the sacrifices I had made, you know, for my family and, you know, what it cost me and, you know, not having my children with me and how much that hurt and how terrible that was. And that's, you know, that's every, I have every reason to drink because if you didn't have your children and you loved your children the way I did, then you'd drink too. Or if you didn't have your granny anymore and she meant everything to you, you'd drink too. You know, all these, um these excuses and you know now in sobriety like first like I am so grateful I'm so grateful for this program I'm so grateful for all of you um, you know I have a wonderful wonderful support network and you know I look back over this past year and, and just you know the work that goes into it if you're willing to do the work and you're willing to stay close to your higher power and do his work well the things that will come to fruition for you they're not you know it's not unattainable you know the promises of aa they're not unattainable they're, i mean if you live to see them come to into action if you are doing the work then you will see it and it, for me it, it didn't take long um, you know, so I realized very early on, you know, I used to cry like, oh, I don't have my children and oh, ugly crying about this and that. And, you know, I, um, yeah, it's not a good look. I'm not going to like, let y'all see that hopefully. Um, so, you know, but then like I stopped and I thought, you know what? Like, yeah, it might have sucked going through these things, but look at how much God saved me from. What if I would have had my children and I'd been drinking and driving with them in the car and I lost them all together? What if I had killed somebody? What if I'd never had the nerve to like stand up for myself and leave my ex-husband? Or, you know, all the, like what did God actually save me from? You know, here I've been boo-boo crying all this time about how awful my life was and not looking at all the blessings that I really, truly had in my life. Um, you know, so 
everything just lined up perfectly for me. And, you know, I, talk, I, I truly do believe that each and every one of us that are in here and that are sober are a miracle. I believe that if we can, you know, I know we all have crazy stories. You know, we hear somebody and you'd be like, dang, that was really cute. You know, and we laugh about it. Other people be like, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> it's like, but, you know, it's funny to us because we're like, you too? You know, so, um, you know, when I look back over this past year, you know, like right before getting sober, um, I got promoted. And then right after that, I hit my 19 years in my career. And then, boom, got the DWI. And I'll tell you what, this is, this is how good I believe this program is, and I believe a relationship with your higher power is, because I, I was facing five charges. I was facing DWI, reckless driving, speeding, obstructing a police officer, and resisting arrest. Can you believe that? Me? <laughs> I, you know, I think about it now, and I'm like, I would have loved to have been, like, on the dash cam. <laughs> like, <laughs> woo! <laughs> you know, so, so I had all these charges that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, and, and it's in federal court, so I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, you know, my lawyer just kind of kicked things down the road, kicked it down the road, and I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, come on, I just need some closure here. And then, so, uh, I had to go to court in January, and I just remember sitting there, and I just said, all right, Lord, like, I'm not going to barter with you. Like, I'm not going to tell you, like, oh, well, if you get me out of this, then I'm not going to do this, this, or this, or I'll do this. Like, I'm not going to barter with you. Like, help me to accept whatever consequences are coming my way. And so then my lawyer comes up to me, and next thing you know, we got continued another month. So I went to court in February of last year, or last month, last February, this past month, a month ago, today actually. Okay. And, um, you know, because I had already agreed to a plea deal. So I, I agreed to a plea deal, and I was like, all right, well, I'm guilty. You know, I did it. So if I agreed to the plea deal, then I would just get charged the DWI, and everything else would disappear. So I'm like, Okay. I'm guilty. All right. I'll, I'll agree to it. So I go and I stand before the judge. And <laughs> the reason why I agreed to the plea deal is because I knew there's no way that I could go to court, you know, and go up against a trial and be like, <laughs> and get a better deal than a plea deal. You know, I was like, what if I get a crappy judge? What if, you know, some, they have somebody that's been, you know, killed in their family by a drunk driver what if they're just having a bad day like all these things that could happen and I said this and I said man I hope this isn't blasphemous because I was like unless the Lord himself comes down and ascends from heaven into that courtroom I'm not getting out of this DWI so I agreed to the plea deal and I'm standing there before the judge and she asked me she, you know I got to speak and I said you know um I said, you know, I'm going to tell you, Your Honor, first of all, thanks for letting me, you know, speak on my behalf. I said, you know, I absolutely love my life. I am completely and absolutely enthralled with where I am. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, if I am convicted of a DUWI, that's a very small price to me to pay for the life that I have now. And I walked out of that courtroom convicted of reckless driving and sentenced to six months probation. And if you, like, there is, you know, somebody was like, well, that's not bad. I was like, that's not bad. Like, are you sure? <laughs> no. Like, I was like, you know, like, there's no other way to explain it. That, to me, that's divine intervention. And that's a result of, you know, truly, like, working this program. I'm not perfect. You know, I have bad days where I'm at work. I'm like, man, principles before personalities. And I'll say, you know, because I'm like, I'm like, like, all right, let's not pop off at the mouth here. But, you know, it's, it's because, you know, like I work with my sponsor. I have, you know, I have a wonderful relationship with her. Um, you know, I have this home group. I have so many people that I lean on and, you know, I reach out when I'm in need. And there's people that are there and always willing to help me. And, you know, and I truly do believe that my life now is a result of this program and my relationship with my higher power. Uh, there's no other way to explain it. Uh, you know, just it's just absolutely amazing. I can't I can't put it any other way. I don't sponsor anyone at the moment, and it's not because I'm not willing. I'm open if there's any 
like new people. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I do, I do, I am involved in, in AA. I, uh, I have a trusted position here in primary purpose that I'm super excited about. And just, you know, just honored to serve. Uh, you know, and, and being able to share my story, like, you know, at Fort Bragg, you know, with others and the people that we come in contact with, we never know, you know, who we're going to touch or what we say and how it's going to affect other people. And, you know, like for me, uh, with my sponsor, I really feel like God just planted her right where she needed to be. Um, you know, I had a temporary sponsor when I was in the treatment. She was absolutely amazing. I felt like God put her right where she was supposed to be. And then uh, when I got home... And uh, I was at the women's meeting, and then she never goes to that meeting, and she was there, and I had shared, and, and then, you know, we just became connected. And, you know, they say that there are no musts in, you know, AA. There's things that we must do if we want to stay sober. That's true. But there's nothing that you must do to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous other than to have a desire to stop drinking. And that's not really how I see it, though, when it comes to my sponsor. So, you know, <laughs> because of my profession, you know, I, I can tell people what to do. I can say, hey, do this. But, you know, typically, I, I like to be nice about it because why not, you know? Like, you get more flies with honey, right? And you get more honeys by being a fly. <laughs> just, <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. <laughs> but anyway, so, like, you know, I could tell people what to do, but nobody likes to be told what to do. And especially if you're an alcoholic, you don't like to be, I know I don't like to be told what to do. You know, like, like, really? So, you know, I'll ask, you know, hey, can you do this for me? So my sponsor, she's absolutely amazing in that sense is that, you know, she'll, she'll let me, you know, be expressive and, you know, if I'm upset or, you know, I'll just, ugh, sometimes she'll let me word vomit all over. And then, you know, and she knows that it's not because I'm trying to be ugly. It's just like, let me get it out. And, you know, sometimes she'll say, well, maybe I'll see you at the meeting tonight. And I'm like, Maybe. But then I'm like, but then, but then I think about it, but I think about it, and I'm like, you know, like, whatever she suggests for me, to me, that's not something that I have the opportunity or option to say no. To me, if she says, oh, well, maybe I'll see you at a meeting tonight, that means she will see me at a meeting later tonight. Or if she says, oh, well, we can go do, like, this service work, you know, that's not... It's not her just really, like, throwing it out there just for gits and shiggles. That's really her way of letting me know, like, hey, like, this is what we're going to do. So, you know, I've never, like, I have this wonderful relationship with her. She's, like, that crazy aunt in everybody's family, the super cool one. Um, and I'm sure, like, back when she was drinking, she was probably real cool. Uh, but um, she's just amazing. And, you know, I, I just adore her. I respect her. I love her. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to know that, you know, like, I'm single. And so I go home at the end of the day, and there's my little dog, Chanel. And I, so that's another thing, a gift of sobriety, is that uh, I've never been a pet person, ever. Cats are a little shady. I'm allergic to them. And then I'm, always, I'm like, petrified of big dogs. Just, like, like, freeze up. And then so when I got home from treatment... There's this little four-and-a-half-pound dog, and her name is Chanel. She's a little Yorkie. And I actually have a dog now. People are like, who are you? Where's Sunday? Like, what'd you do with her? Oh, wait, and you let her sleep on your bed? Like, oh, my gosh. So, you know, that's another gift of sobriety is I have this little emotional support companion. She's the coolest <laughs> little buddy ever, you know. Yeah, she's, yeah, and, you know, and she listens to me. She doesn't argue. She doesn't tell me what to do. It's really awesome. And, you know, so I, you know, that's like another gift of sobriety. Like the gift, like I didn't trust women before I came into the program. They're all catty and they want your man and all this crazy stuff, you know. And, and now, like, I have an amazing network of women that, you know, I trust wholeheartedly. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to to grow and to grow with other people and to learn from them, to lean on them. I can't, I can't even express it sometimes, you know, it's, it's just absolutely insane to me. And, you know, and I think about how insane my drinking was, but, you know, like I never fathomed a life this good. Not, and, and they say, you know, they say it keeps getting better. And I'm like, really? Like, how is that possible? You know, um, so it's just, it's good. God is good. Um, you know, I, prayer, meditation, that's huge for me. Um, asking, you know, for, like, God's will to be done, not mine. And, 
you know, throw in there and help me not be a spoiled brat about things when I don't get my way. Because, you know, I can, I can do that. Um, and it's just asking, like, hey, you know, God, sometimes I just talk to him when I'm driving in the car. You know, I don't have to always, you know, I'm in the shower in the morning washing my hair. And like, all right, God, what's the plan for the day? You know, show me your will. Give me a clue. Help me to hear you. Help me to see you. Uh, you know, and, and for me, that spirituality is something that, you know, I realized that it didn't matter how much alcohol I drank, you know, um, if there were other substances, no matter what, like, it would never have quenched the thirst that I had for spirituality and for a higher power, you know. And so um, coming into the program, like, my conception of my higher power has really, like, morphed and changed from what I knew as a, as a young girl. And, you know, he's kind and uh, loving and, you know, he wants me, you know, regardless. Regardless of if I'm having a bad day, regardless of all of my character defects, like, he wants me. And I, th I just think that's super cool. And that I could talk to him just like I can talk to you or you. And, um, you know, that's what gets me through the day, the prayer, the meditation, the clarity that comes from that, the ability to really pause and ask for guidance instead of, like I said, popping off at the mouth. You know, like I have an ex-husband that, you know, sometimes I used to wish that he'd get run over by a bus. And that's not the case, you know, like I have an awesome relationship with him and his wife. She's absolutely amazing. And, you know, the gratitude that comes from this program and truly like looking at all that I'm blessed with and not worrying about the things that I don't have because I have what I need. I have my sobriety, I have AA, and I have my relationship with my higher power, you know, and it all comes from these steps. You know, I had no clue that my life was unmanageable. I just knew I wasn't in a good place. I did know that. I was in a dark place. And, you know, the ability to just say, you know what? This isn't working out for me. It's not not my way. So to give it to God and really, you know, look inward through the fourth step and to realize the patterns and the fears that I had and that, you know, resulted in a lot of the decisions that I made the rest of the way in my life. I'm like, damn. Man, if, if everybody had this program, we'd have an awesome society, you know. And then, uh, you know, just talking with my sponsor about stuff and, you know, all of it, working the steps, working the program, it, you know, it really just opens you up for so much, so many opportunities, you know. And I feel like I'm exactly where I need to be. Like, I have arrived. Like, sobriety is where I belong. I cannot do God's work if I'm drunk. I know God doesn't want me to be drunk. Like, I have arrived, and I just pray that I'm pliable and, you know, there so that when God says, hey, here's this opportunity, I'm like, all right. You know, and I know that there's times where I might be like, ugh, I really have to, but, you know, that's where the prayer and meditation comes in and, you know, talking to people in your network, talking to your sponsor. Um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I, I like my cheeks hurt, from, you know, because that's how I feel about it. Uh, you know, just absolutely, did, did we get cut off? It's still okay. okay. You know, so, um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything important that I might have missed. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, I, like now I have what I need. I have, you know, wonderful people in my life that are here and you know and I do believe like the Lord works in mysterious ways just like I said I was supposed to speak earlier today got canceled and then boom here I am um surprise and then um you know just the fact that I came back here you know so I was here and I was in South Carolina then I was back here then I was in Washington State and I feel like God brought me back here to get me sober in Moore County where AA is absolutely magical you know, in this home group, like, I, I just, it's magical. That's exactly what it is. It's magic here. And, um, you know, like, where I had to support people because I couldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it on my own this past year. I mean, I live here in Pinehurst. My commute to work is an hour away. I wasn't able to drive on post for a year. So, I mean, go fit. Like, I had people that were willing to help me instead of saying, like, you got yourself into this. There were people that were here that helped me because I, I knew I couldn't do it by myself. And, you know, I feel like he, God brought me back here to get me sober around the people that he knew I needed. And I feel like that's how it happens. We, you know, we open up our hearts and, and our minds to people and to 
really allow others in and the connections that we make, you know, are just magnificent. You know, you have people, we have people in our life that will help us for no reason other than to help us. We have people in our life that really care about us and want to see us sober for no other reason than they want to see us to be happy and healthy. And I don't, I don't think I can add anything to that other than like, it's an amazing program. It really is. I love it. I love being sober. And I hope, I truly hope that, you know, I'm not going to say never, um, but I will say that I hope I don't put a drink to my lips. I hope that this fire in my heart lasts for as long as I live and breathe here on earth. I pray, you know, my worst days in sobriety, they haven't even been that bad. It's been like, eh, I can't. No, no, me would have probably lost my cool over it for sure. But, you know, that like it's not bad. The worst day is just not that bad. And, you know, my, my hope is that I die a sober woman and with a strong relationship with my higher power and that, you know, I can just be a light, even if it's just a little flicker that, you know, somebody sees a light in me. And that's all I have. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Sunday.